nice that my lady sat right up front for me. Thank you. Um, thank you. So, Rings of Power. Um, it was an Amazon Prime series that came out toward the end of the summer. It's a prequel to Lord of the Rings. It takes place about a thousand years before the Lord of the Rings. Um, our family would watch these episodes as they came out week by week for season one. Um, the screenwriters totally set up the episodes so that the viewers were kind of left in the dark about the identity of some key characters. In particular, there's um, one character who crashes into Middle Earth in this ball of flying fire, um, and he's just referred to as the stranger in every episode. And so we're trying to figure out who he is. And I felt kind of handicapped in my Lord of the Rings understanding because I haven't read the books, and it's been many years since I've seen the movie. But I have a 17-year-old son named Drew, and he is a Lord of the Rings expert. He's read the books multiple times. He's reading them again currently right now. He's seen the movies multiple times. Um, and so he was my crutch to help me answer all my questions about who this person is supposed to be. Anyway, um, each week we would talk about, in particular, who is the identity of the stranger. Um, and we just hope that by the end of season one, at least that part of the plot would be resolved before we had to wait a whole year for season two. Here's a picture of the stranger, by the way. Um, so the final episode comes, um, and it's coming to the end of it, and the still identified stranger says a sentence seven words long, and then the credits roll. And I'm like, I can't believe they left us hanging, and we're gonna have to wait until season two. We don't know how long that's gonna be um, to find out who the stranger is. And Drew's like, are you kidding? We know exactly who the stranger is. He just said, blank, 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 blank. Okay, I'm putting in blanks here because I really don't want to give a spoiler for you who haven't finished the series or if you're ever going to watch the series. Sorry, we're just going to use blanks there. But I'm just going to say that those seven words, they're a dead giveaway um, to the identity of the stranger if you know Lord of the Rings better than I did. Okay, so now let's think about Matthew. So we've been reading chapter by chapter, and we've gotten to watch the disciples and the crowd as they've wrestled to try to figure out the true identity of this man, Jesus. So more and more hints are given to them along the way until they finally arrive at this jaw-dropping moment where they say, at least some of them do, I know who this is. And guess what? That jaw-dropping moment happens in tonight's text. We're going to come to a place where Jesus is going to say eight words that are a total identity giveaway, revealing that he is God. And if Jesus is God and not merely a wonderful teacher or a powerful prophet, then that changes everything. So here's the big idea for tonight. Those who've had the true identity of Jesus revealed to them will respond with faith and with following. So that's pretty much where we're headed as I try to navigate 67 verses with you. Yeah, we're not going to cover it all. So last week we finished up Sermon on the Mount, um, and we read how when Jesus finished teaching, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. And in their astonishment, they're left with this question of who is this man who teaches with such authority? And then after a giant pause of action for three chapters, literally, we just felt like, We've been sitting and listening and learning during Matthew 5, 6, and 7. Now, all of a sudden, ch Matthew chapters 8 and 9, it's making up for lost time. So now it feels like we're sort of running to catch up and watch all that Jesus does. Um, in Matthew 8 and 9, we see scene after scene of Jesus at work, demonstrating his comprehensive authority over both supernatural and natural forces. So he has authority over nature, as he calls, calms a storm, authority over sickness and disease, as he heals everyone who comes to him, and over spiritual forces, evil spiritual forces, as he heals people from demons. And each of these scenes provides yet another hint into the true identity of Jesus. But so far, none are definitive. None act as a dead giveaway, revealing who he is. Because the thing is, we see some Old Testament prophets 
performing similar miraculous acts that we see Jesus do in Matthew 8 and 9. So we see leprosy healed um, in the ministries of both Moses and Elijah. Or is that Elisha? Put it right there. It's Elisha. Um, and then we see that Elijah will pray and forces of nature are affected so that rain will stop or stop in response to his prayers. And then we see the dead brought back to life in the ministries of both Elijah and Elisha. But there's something remarkably different as we consider the miracles of the Old Testament prophets and compare them with the miracles of Jesus. So the prophets are described as asking God to move and work. So we see them praying for people to be healed or praying for there to be rain or no rain or praying for the dead to be raised. But what does Jesus say in the storm? Does he pray that it will stop? No. Here's what we read. Jesus rebuked the wind and the sea and there was a great calm. And then when he encounters two demon-possessed men, does he pray for God to deliver him? No. In a single authoritative word, he says, go. And the demons went. So we have hint after hint so far in Matthew, revealing Jesus' identity as being more than a wonderful teacher, more than a powerful prophet, until we come to the story of the paralytic in chapter 9. In this story, we're going to find more than just another hint about who Jesus is. And here we have a clear revealing where Jesus claims to be God. So I don't know if you've ever talked to someone um, and they tell you that they don't think that Jesus actually claimed to be God in Scripture because you don't have Jesus saying, I am God, right? So if you remember one thing um, as you leave here tonight, I really hope that you can remember this story of the paralytic and how in eight words that Jesus speaks, he is claiming that he is God. And getting into the boat, he crossed over and came to his own city. And behold, some people brought to him a paralytic lying on a bed. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Eight words. Before we consider what those eight words reveal about Jesus, I just want to pause for a minute and think about what those eight words reveal about the paralytic. So this was the day before wheelchairs. So if you couldn't walk, you would always be dependent on someone to take you, as in physically carry you anywhere you wanted to go. So in the paralytic's case, it took four friends to carry him around on a mat. So we get that detail in Mark chapter 2, where the same story is told. So back in those days, a broken bone that didn't set properly could be enough to render someone a lifelong cripple. So a couple of weeks ago, I received the following text from a dear friend of mine in Asheville. I took a screenshot of it. Um, she writes, Hi, I'm fine, but I'm in the ER because I fell off a ladder. And it was stupid, and I'm in a lot of pain, and I'm not sure if my shoulder and my wrist are broken, but it looks um, pretty sure that they might be. X-ray soon, I knew you would pray. Thank you. Then she goes on to write after. We're headed, headed home from the hospital, broken wrist and shoulder. I have a cast, and I need to see the doctor about my wrist on Monday to see if it needs surgery. So grateful it's not worth it. Worse. So it turns out she went to the doctor on Monday after the Friday accident. She did need surgery to realign the bones. They had a spot the following day, um, and she had surgery. So she fell off the ladder on Friday. Already in Tuesday, she'd had the surgery. So back in Matthew's day, there would have been no ER, no X-ray, no CT scan, and no surgery. So maybe for Ginger, it would have meant her right arm with a broken wrist, broken shoulder, misaligned, would have been out of commission her whole life. So if you could ask the paralytic in Matthew 9, what was one answer to prayer he could have? I'm pretty sure he would have said, I want to be able to walk. That was his most pressing, in-your-face kind of need that he had, or so he thought. When he finally gets to Jesus, what does Jesus say to him first? Is it, take heart, my son, your paralysis is over? Nope. It's, take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. Turns out physical healing was not his most pressing need. Forgiveness from sins was his most pressing, desperate need. Paralysis had deformed him, and unless he was healed, he was going to be deformed his whole life. But sin had also deformed him, just as it deforms each of us. We are blinded and broken by sin, broken in our relationships with each other and with God, and it's sin that has more power um, to damage us than any injury 
ever could, because the effects of untreated sin will last forever. If not dealt with, sin will ultimately destroy us. So when we hear Jesus say to us, take heart, my daughter, your sins are forgiven, we should be eternally sighing in relief that our most pressing, desperate need is finally and forever taken care of through the forgiveness won for us by Jesus' death on the cross. Okay, so let's unpause and scoot back to considering what those eight words reveal about Jesus. Take heart, my son, your sins are forgiven. So Jesus is claiming with these words to be God. So hang on here, what? He only said the guy's sins were forgiven. So that's what it sounds like to our 21st century ears. But just like I needed my resident Lord of the Rings expert to help me understand the significance of the stranger's seven words at the end of season one, um, we need to ask what those eight words of Jesus signify to the experts of Hebrew lore and of Old Testament scripture, and that would have been the scribes and the Pharisees. So to them, it sounded like blasphemy. To them, it sounded like Jesus was claiming to be God and they were not happy. And behold, some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. So what difference does it make in the lives of his followers, whether Jesus is a wonderful teacher, like they believed him to be as his Sermon on the Mount wrapped up, or if he is the Son of God, very God of God? Well, if he is God, we should respond to him with faith, and we should follow him. But not all faith and following are the same. So faith can fall along a spectrum with great faith at one end and no faith at the other. That's my first spectrum up here. And we could plot following along a spectrum as well with no following at one end and great following at the other. So that's where we're gonna head now. We're gonna look at first three kinds of faith. No faith, little faith, great faith as demonstrated in the passage. And we're actually gonna start with great faith. There are a few examples of great faith that I could have chosen, but um, I just picked my favorite because I could. And behold, a woman who had suffered from a discharge of blood for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment. For she said to herself, if only I touch his, his garment, I will be made well. Okay, ladies, can we think about her suffering for a minute? First of all, can you imagine having a period for 12 years straight? I shudder at the thought. So just think about the lack of energy from loss of iron and the unstable emotions. My family would suffer. <laughs> um, imagine the discouragement of 12 years of unanswered prayer for healing. And add to that, she lived back then before the days of commercial sanitary products. Am I the only one who wonders how women even managed back then? And then add to that, the whole dimension of being ceremonially unclean because of her bleeding. So for 12 years, she would have been on the outside of community, excluded from temple worship. And then the Gospel of um, Mark chapter in chapter 8 adds a few more details to her situation. And there we learn that she had spent all of her money on doctors, and still she wasn't healed. So she's unwell, without money, and alone. She's utterly helpless. So I think that the reason this is my favorite example of great faith is because it demonstrates such a beautiful picture of someone coming to Jesus with absolute need and having absolutely nothing to offer him but her faith. What a picture of being poor in spirit, that first and foundational beatitude from Matthew chapter 5. In her poverty and desperation, she reaches out with empty hands in faith to Jesus. And what is the result? Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly, the woman was made well. I heard it said recently that it takes nothing to come to Jesus, but most of us don't have that. This woman came to Jesus with nothing. So when the Pharisees criticized Jesus for eating with the tax collectors and sinners in tonight's passage, do you remember what he told them? He said, that he'd come not to call the righteous, but sinners to himself. 
The Pharisees did not come to Jesus with nothing. Their hands were full of their meticulous law keeping. And then they're striving to keep the letter of the law with cold hearts um, and empty hearts. It was a tiresome burden. And yet that was what they clung to deep down for worth before God and others. If they were to empty their hands and let go of their record of self-righteous law following, then they would have had nothing. Then they would be on level ground with the hemorrhaging woman, on level ground with the tax collectors and sinners. And then they would have been ready to receive from Jesus. But that was just too low for them to go. So what about you? As you come to Jesus, can you honestly sing, Nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling? Or are your hands full as you come to Jesus so that you don't come with nothing? What do you hold on to as an unspoken measure of your worth that keeps you from settling into that low and level place at the foot of the cross? Are your hands maybe full of your wealth? Are your family background? Are your image? Are your education? Are your abilities? Are your accomplishments? Are your kids' abilities? Are your kids' accomplishments? The Pharisees refused to come to Jesus with nothing, and so they're left with full hands but empty hearts. And it's the bleeding woman, not the Pharisee, who makes it to our whiteboard as an example of great faith. I'm going to put the healed woman because I don't want to leave her bleeding forever up here. So we're going to put the healed woman. Okay, let's think about little faith. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we're perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? So little faith there lands somewhere between no faith and great faith. So no faith on the left would have never bothered even waking Jesus up. No faith would have had no more confidence in an awake Jesus than in a sleeping Jesus. But what would great faith have looked like in the boat? Maybe it would have looked like the children's song, with Jesus in the boat, you can smile in the storm, smile in the storm. Maybe with great faith, the disciples would have seen the storm and smiled because Jesus was in the boat and they would know that sleeping or awake, Jesus was with them, so all would be well. But that's not me. For me, it's more like, with Jesus in the boat, you can smile after the storm. <laughs> and I wish I could say that I smile in the storm, knowing that Jesus is with me. But generally, I don't regain my smile until the storm is past. And then I look back, and I see how Jesus helped me, and then I chide myself for not having smiled in the storm. Part of the trouble with little faith is that it just fails to honor Jesus. So as my kids see me trust God, but worry at the same time, what does that tell them about how trustworthy God really is? Do you know what the most frequent command of scripture is? Don't, don't fear. I think it's the most frequent. I haven't counted at all. Google says it's the most frequent, and, I'm, and I, it's there a lot. I think it is. Google actually says it occurs 365 times, which is kind of cool if we get one command to not be afraid for every single day of the year in all its varieties. But I don't really know if they're 365, but it's a lot. But one thing I have noticed, so often when we're told not to be afraid, the reason is given right there with it, because God is with us. So we don't, have a we don't have a promise of a life free from storms if we follow Jesus. But what is promised is that God will be with us all the times, in times of peace and in stormy trouble. Isaiah 43 says, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. At least the disciples knew where to go for help in their fear. They cried to Jesus, save us, we are perishing. So if we find ourselves in a desperate situation and we're full of fear, the best thing we can do, even if our faith is small and our fear is huge, is to go to Jesus and to cry to him, save me, I am perishing. So I need to write down the disciples here for little faith. And then we're going to look at no faith. Um, 
And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him coming out of the tombs, so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O son of God? I'm sure they didn't sound like that, but I don't know how to do a demon voice, and I don't really want to. <laughs> so, <laughs> have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them, and the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs. And behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. So do you ever think, if we could just see the miracles for ourselves that Jesus did, then we would really believe. But what kind of miracle did the gathering pig herders see and then run to tell the city about? They saw two men delivered from demon possession. They saw a whole herd of pigs go cuckoo crazy as demons entered them um, at Jesus' command. And after hearing about that miracle, did the city rush out to Jesus and bring all their sick ones to him for them to be healed? No, they begged him to leave. This is sad to me, like what a wasted, missed opportunity. They saw he had power and authority to cast out demons, but they had no faith in him. They witnessed a mighty miracle, but they had zero faith. So I'm gonna write herders and, I'm just gonna write pig people here because that's the herders and the town. No faith. Actually, I don't think it should be a line here, right? Because it should be a ray. Right? Because you can keep going in great faith, but no faith is just in here. No following. It's just going to be there. It's just going to end. All right. Um, okay, before we leave this scene, there is another example of no faith that I see. So what about the demons? What kind of belief did they have? They had bang on correct understanding of who Jesus was when they said, what have you to do with us, O son of God? Like, they knew that he was the son of God. So when we talk about saving faith, it has to be more than correct mental understanding of the identity and work of Jesus. James tells us similarly, you believe that God is one and you do well, but even the demons believe and they shudder. So we've looked at three kinds of faith um, and now we're gonna move to our following spectrum and look at three kinds of following. So the demons had firm, settled mental belief um, as evidenced in their calling Jesus Son of God, but they had no obedient, submissive following as shown in their question, what have you to do with us? So they are actually my example of no following. So, yeah, their question was, what have you to do with us? So do you know anyone like this? Are you someone like this? Someone who knows and believes all the Sunday school answers about the identity and work of Jesus, but whose life has little or no evidence of obedient following? In essence, you are asking Jesus the same defiant question that the demons asked. What have you to do with me? What have you to do with the way that I spend my free time or I spend my money? What have you to do with the, what I choose to watch or where I choose to go? What have you to do with who I hang out with or what I do with my body? So questions like these are acceptable and even commendable in today's you do you culture, right? But these questions are not the kind of questions that a follower of Jesus is gonna be asking. So if the demons are an example of no following at at no following at all. I think the two would-be followers that we meet in um, Matthew chapter 8 would land somewhere along our spectrum, just a little bit to the right of no following, but really far from faithful following. And I wasn't sure if I should call this um, feeble following or faulty following, but I picked flimsy following because I liked it best. So um, here's the first would-be follower. And a scribe came up and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. So this scribe is really eager. He appears ready to follow Jesus even before Jesus calls him to do so. How does Jesus respond to him? Is it, oh boy, a scribe, this is great. Someone with your education and social standing, 
you could really uh, give a boost to the image of our group. Thank you for volunteering. <laughs> Hardly. He said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. So how uncomfortable would it be to follow Jesus and have no home base to return to in the evenings? Like, am I the only one feeling uneasy here? I'm all for serving Jesus as long as I can have a comfy home and a bed to return to at the end of the day. Here's a confession about me. I'm a homebody introvert who's happy as a clam not going out. Seriously, even coming out to church on a Monday night can be uncomfortable for me. Even tonight, as I pulled out of the driveway, like to come to church, I'm already picturing myself back in my happy place, at home, in the flannel sheets, two pillows, one for my head, one for my knees, all snuggled up. Ready? Like, yeah. So that's the first would-be follower. Flimsy faith because he loved his comfort. So how about the second would-be follower? Another disciple said to him, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me and let, leave the dead to bury their own dead. So whereas the first guy was a little too quick in his following, the second guy is too slow in his following. So what's going on here? What's wrong with waiting a few days um, for the sake of burying a parent who just died? But based on some commentary reading I did, this isn't what's going on. To bury a father is an idiom that just means to fulfill your family responsibilities throughout a parent's lifetime. And it's possible that this guy was hanging around waiting for his parents to die, not just to care for them, but to make sure that the inheritance got settled properly when the time came. So this would-be disciple doesn't flat out say no to Jesus' invitation to follow. Instead, he says, hang on. Could you wait for a more convenient season of life for me to follow? So I just want to encourage each of you here, don't wait for a more convenient season of life to follow Jesus. So maybe some of you students are thinking, oh, once you graduate, that'll be a better time to fully follow Jesus. Or maybe some of you with young kids at home think it would be more convenient to follow when those kids start school, or when they finally move out of the house, or when you retire. So I'm not sure that there's ever a convenient season to follow Jesus. So can I just encourage all of us to seek to follow him today, regardless of our particular life circumstance or season? Don't wait to follow Jesus by walking in sexual purity until a more convenient season when you're finally married. Don't wait to follow Jesus by forgiving that person who offended you until a more convenient season when they finally acknowledge how much they've hurt you. Don't wait to tithe to the church until a more convenient season when you finally have that dream job that you've been hoping for. Follow Jesus in the inconvenience of today. Okay, I've got to write down these would-be followers for our flimsy followers. You know who I'm talking about, the two guys. And our faithful following, we're about to talk about, this is actually going to be Matthew himself. So, um, follow me, Jesus said to Matthew in chapter 9, verse 9. And our text simply said, he rose and followed Jesus. And do you remember back in chapter 4 when Matthew called two groups of disciples? In both of those, it said that they immediately left their nets and followed Jesus. Convenient time or not, having a comfortable place to lay their heads at the end of the day or not, Matthew and the other disciples from chapter 4 are my example of faithful following. So in case any of us here thinks that that was a special following that the original disciples were called to that's different from what would be expected of us today, listen to Mark 8, 34. Jesus said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. And that anyone includes each of us in this room. So why do we hesitate to follow Jesus? Ultimately, for me, it's because I don't want to suffer. Denying myself and taking up my cross sounds like it's going to involve suffering. And it sounds like it's not going to be comfortable or convenient. So ladies, what is the message that culture cries out to us every day? I hear lots of talk of self-care, but not much about self-denial. I hear lots of talk about creating and maintaining a comfortable surroundings, but not much about taking up my cross. And lots of talk about following your heart, 
but not much about following Jesus. Are these cultural messages sabotaging our desire to follow Jesus fully? The call to comfort and convenience is everywhere, so I brought a magazine article, uh, cover to show you. So just in this cover, the title says, Real Simple, Life Made Easier. Sounds pretty convenient, right? Welcome to Cozy. Sounds comfortable. Delicious dinners faster. That's comfortable in a convenient way, right? And then my favorite is easy ways to feel calm. Convenient ways to be comfortable. Yeah. <laughs> so there's nothing wrong with enjoying um, a comfortable place to live that God has provided unless my desire for that is so strong that I would be unwilling to leave it if Jesus called me into the inconvenient and uncomfortable elsewhere. Have you ever made a decision where you felt like you were following God's lead and then things went sideways and you ended up in a place of suffering? Sometimes we think when that happens that maybe we didn't hear God correctly and we misfollowed because surely if we were following, we wouldn't be in this messy, uncomfortable place. But did you notice how it was that the disciples got into the boat in the first place that led him into the storm? They followed Jesus there. I hope you know the story of Corey Timboom. So she and her family followed Jesus by hiding Jews in their home above their watch, watch shop in Holland. And then when they were discovered by the Gestapo, her family followed Jesus right into a concentration camp. It's hard to picture a more uncomfortable and inconvenient way to follow Jesus. And it sounds like Corey followed Jesus right into the middle of a storm. She writes about this in The Hiding Place. If any of you have grown soft in your willingness to follow Jesus when it's not convenient and when it's uncomfortable, I would highly recommend reading The Hiding Place. Sometimes I get asked if I would return, um, if I would like to return to our village in Cameroon, West Africa. We lived there as a family um, for almost 10 years, working on a Bible translation project for a Muslim people group. I have a great excuse for not returning. The Boko Haram, it's a terrorist group, they have a presence in our area, and all four missionaries have left. So my easy answer is that the Boko Haram threat keeps me from having to answer with the unsettling truth that I don't know if I would be eager to go back there now if I could. I've grown, so, I've grown softer since this photo of me at the start of our time there. Over these years back in North America, I've grown quite fond of the convenience and comfort of plentiful electricity, hot and cold running water, internet, grocery stores down the street, a church to worship in, and, and I think I need to read The Hiding Place again. So following Jesus is going to look different for each of us based on our various life seasons and contexts. For some of us, following Jesus might mean packing up and moving to the other side of the world to live and work among an unreached people group. But for most of us, following is going to look pretty ordinary. So my dear daughter, Annie, made me this little banner out of paper and ribbon a few years ago, and it simply says follow on it. I've hung it in the laundry room in our basement, and it's a constant reminder to me to follow Jesus in the ordinariness of the day to day. So what could be more ordinary than doing laundry? For you mothers of young children, you have lots of laundry to do, right? So many little socks and t-shirts pile up every day and you find yourself over and over again at that washing machine. So what would following Jesus look like as you do the laundry again? Maybe it looks like seeing your service to your family as your service to Christ looking to that audience of one for approval and recognition in your work instead of anyone else? Or what about a different ordinary context? Maybe you wrapped up what you needed to get done for the day at work early, and you're hurrying to the car to get home before traffic gets heavy. And let's say it's Monday, and you want to have a little bit of time at home to relax and eat some supper and maybe finish your homework before coming to church. And you're on your way to the car and someone stops you and they ask if you have a minute to chat about something they're going through. In that moment, what does following Jesus look like? Are you willing right then to set aside the comfort and convenience of an early drive home to follow Jesus in this pretty ordinary way? Regardless of your season or context of life, what if tomorrow morning, before you get out of bed, you stop and pray simply, Lord Jesus, I am yours. Would you help me today to faithfully follow you? 
If Jesus is merely a good teacher, we can be astonished with what he says. Um, but we're free to trust what he says or not. And if he's merely a powerful prophet, we're free to put his words into action or not. We're free to follow him or not. But if he could forgive sins, then he is God. And everything is at stake in how we respond to him. If he is God, will you empty your hands of every earthly trust and boast so that you come to him with nothing and then cling tightly with both those hands to Jesus in faith? If he is God, will you faithfully follow him even when it's inconvenient, even when it's uncomfortable, and even into the middle of a storm? And if you ever wonder what Jesus knows about doing hard things that are uncomfortable and inconvenient, you need look no further than the cross. So Gospel Connections question two sent us to Isaiah 53. This is such a beautiful picture of the cross written 700 years before the cross. Um, if over Christmas break you're bored and you wanna memorize scripture, I would really recommend memorizing Isaiah 53, three to six. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with bitterest grief. We turned our back on him and he looked the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God for his own sins, but he was wounded and crushed for our sins. He was beaten that we might have peace. He was whipped and we are healed. All of us have strayed away like sheep. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord has laid on him the guilt and sins of us all. So I was hoping that we could sing a song to finish, but they couldn't find it. So we're still gonna sing it. Trouble is it's gonna be a cappella. So we're just gonna sing the part of the song I was really interested in. So please, if you know the song, help me and sing. Um, so the song is I Will Follow. Um, but hopefully you can pick it up halfway through, okay? When the boat is tossed upon the waves, when I wonder if you'll keep me safe, even in the storms I'll follow you. Even in the storms I'll follow you. I believe everything that you say you are. I believe and I have seen your unchanging heart in the good things and in the hardest part. I believe and I will follow you. I believe and I will follow you. Lord Jesus, we are yours. Would you help us today to believe everything that you've said about who you are, not just with our heads, but with all of our hearts deep down. And would you help us today to faithfully follow you? We are so needy, Lord. Enable us to come to you with empty hearts, with empty hands, and to cling to you forever. Lord, help us to trust you as Savior and to follow you as King. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you can head to your tables and wrap up.